next version of this, or next domain, of where you begin to see the fact that these rules are underlying an awful lot of things. Suppose here you were studying earthquakes. <clears throat> And apparently there's just like little earthquakes going on, you know, 20 times an hour or so, all down in the Richter scale of, you know, one quarter or who knows what. But you get enough of these, you get a huge database, and you can begin to graph the frequency of Richter 1 earthquakes and how often do you get the Richter 2 and Richter 3 and all of that. And you graph it and it's going to look something like this. A distribution like that, which is obviously there's a huge number of number one categories and it drops off until the extremely rare at this end, there's a distribution which is mathematically can be described something called a power law distribution with a certain angle to it. And okay, so here's the relationship between how often you get little teensy earthquakes and the big ones. Now instead, what you do is something much more uh, different from that, which is you look at 50,000 people and you look at their phone calls over the course of a year and you keep track of how far the phone call was, how distant the person is that they called. And now you map the distance, the very shortest calls, the very longest, and the frequency, and it's the exact same curve. It's the same power law distribution. Next version of it, this was a study that was done, which was, I don't quite know how these guys did it. They, I always get lost in the math on these. But in this one, what they did was they took a whole bunch of marked dollar bills, and they started in the middle of, I don't know where, I think it was a Columbia something, and they were somehow able to keep track of how far the bills had traveled a week later, and asking, OK, how many of the bills had traveled no more than a mile? How many? Five miles? How many? And it was the exact same curve. And people now have been showing the same power law distribution. Here's some of the things that have been shown. The number of links that websites have to other websites. The number that have only one link, the power law distribution. Proteins, the number of proteins showing certain degrees of complexity and the numbers dropping off with the same power law. Here's one, which is the number of emails somebody sends over the course of the year. This is the one that was done at Columbia. They got access to everybody's email records. I don't understand how they could have done this, but it was a couple of million over the course of the year. And what they showed was the frequency, how many people were making this small the number of emails over the, and the same power law. Then there's this totally crazy one, which is, OK, do you guys know the, the Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation thing there? Okay, someone went and did a study about this that they got like every actor that they could find who was in a film in the last two years and they got all of their filmographies and they generated their Kevin Bacon degrees of freedom, degrees of... Uh, Sing it out. Okay, and they figured it out, the number for each individual, and then they graphed it. How many people were six degrees of separation away? How many were five? So on. And it's the same pattern. And this one keeps popping up, this power law business. And what you see intrinsic in that is it's a fractal. Because some of the time, you're talking about what's happening with the tectonic plates on Earth. And some of the time, you're talking about phone calls. And some of the time, you're talking about how molecules interact with each other. There's something emergent that goes on there, which is an outcome of some of these simple attraction repulsion rules, an outcome of simple pioneer generation and then random movement ones, and outcome structures like these. This winds up being applicable in a very interesting domain biologically. Okay, so now we go back to the traveling salesman problem, and we're having now a cellular version of it in terms of networks. You've got a whole bunch of nodes here, and the choice that each node has to make in effect is how many connections it will make in the network to other nodes and how far should those connections be. Should it only connect with one's way out there? What does it want to do? 
That's nonsense in terms of optimizing a system. What do you want your distribution of connections of nodes in a network to be? What is it you want to optimize? You want to get a system that has very stable, solid interactions amongst clusters of nodes, but nonetheless occasionally has the capacity to make long distance connections there. And what you wind up seeing is if you generate a power law distribution in terms of, OK, I'm going to, all of my projections are going to be within this distance, and this then the same power law distribution, so that the vast majority of the nodes in the network are having very local connections, but still there's a possibility now and then of very long ones, you get a system that is the most optimal for solving problems most cheaply, cheaply in whatever the term is there, and this solves it for you. And then you look at brain development. So you've got neurons forming in the cortex, in a fetal cortex, and you've got neurons. You've got all these nodes. And they have to figure out how to wire up with each other and how to wire up in a way that is most efficient. What's most efficient in order to be able to do the sorts of things the cortex specializes in? And you now begin to look at the distribution of projections, and it's a power law relationship. Most neurons in the cortex are having the vast majority of their projections very local, but then you have ones now and then that have moderate ones, even rarer ones that have extremely long ones. And you look, and this is how the cortex is wired up. It follows a power law distribution. And what this allows you to do is have clusters of stable functional interactions. But every now and then, you can talk to somebody way over at the other end of the cortex to see what's happening. Interesting finding, autism. Autism, people have been looking for what's up biologically, and the initial assumptions would be there's not going to be enough neurons in some part of the brain, or maybe too many in another. What appears to be the case so far is there's a relatively normal number of neurons in the cortex. But then some people started studying the projection profiles of neurons in the cortex of individuals with autism post-mortem, very rare to get these, and you see a power law distribution, but it's a different one. It's a steeper one. What does that mean? In the cortex of autistic individuals, way more of the connections are little local ones. There's far fewer of the long distance ones. There are way more local ones. What does that produce? Little pockets, little modules of function that are isolated from other ones. And that, in some ways, is what's going on functionally in someone with autism. There is a lack of integration of a whole bunch of these different functions there. And that's what happens when you have maybe a mutation or maybe some epigenetic something or other prenatally that changes the shape of the power law distribution. Interesting. There's a gender difference in the power law distribution of wiring in the cortex, which is in the typical female brain, if this is the power law distribution, and in the male brain, it's a little steeper. Male brains are more modular in their wiring. What's the biggest part of the brain? OK, we're running out of space here. There it is. There's the brain in cross-section. And you've got cortex here and cortex there. And famously, here's all the cell bodies. And when projections are going from one hemisphere to the other, it goes across this huge bundle of axons called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is thicker in women than in men, on the average. It is thicker in females than in males because the power law pattern is such that there are more long distance connections in female networks, and thus it's a thicker corpus callosum. The same thing is playing out with connections like this and connections, but this is the big honker one. You get a thinner corpus callosum in men you get an even thinner course of corpus callosum in people with autism. Again, that hyper male notion there of Baron Cohn's, what you have here is perfectly normal number of neurons, probably even perfectly normal number of connections between the neurons, but they're more local, they're more isolated in the autistic cortex. There's less integration of function. It's more isolated islands of function there.